Good evening, Dark City. It's the Permaculture Show. <laughs> Here we are again. Right. Okay, well, I've got Bob with me as always. Hi, Bob. Hi, Norris. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good. Certainly with all this weather, it's been amazing, hasn't it? Yeah, oh, fantastic. I've had an amazing germination rate. I can't quite believe it. I don't want to get too overconfident, but it's all going very well. <laughs> well, everything's rushing to get out of the ground now, isn't it? Mm, it's mm. been delayed for a month. Yeah, yeah, it has. Well, I've managed to, I've uh, made nettle soup today, and I also made um, dandelion syrup this week, and I've been having lots of salads and lots of flowers. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> you sound you sound like you've got lots of energy. I have, yes. I don't know where it's come from. <laughs> At least I know where to focus it these days. That's the main thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, yes, we've got a guest this evening, so I'm really, really pleased to welcome Steve to the show. Hi, Steve. Hi, Norris. Welcome. Thanks, and uh, thanks for inviting me on. Oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. Well, that is, you know, one of the main sort of functions of the show, as I was saying to you. I just, you know, I really want to spread the permaculture word and just get on people that are inspirational and that are actually doing it, you know, and getting on with it and just inspiring people to just do something, really. (laughs) Um, Yeah. 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 So um, you're part of um, Permanent Culture now, which I am, uh, well, no, I'm not ashamed to say. I'm a big fan. I'll follow the page on Facebook and also the website, which is a fantastic resource. Um, so we'll we'll put the links up to that. Um, so, and you're up, is, is it Bolton, Steve? You're yeah, in? I'm in Bolton, um, a little sort of northern ex-industrial working class town outside of Manchester. But it's a uh, very, very vibrant little town. There's quite a few growing groups popping up here and there. It's quite close to field and open space, which is good. <laughs> mm, definitely, definitely. So, um, so I suppose we just start at the beginning, really, Steve. If I ask you um, how you sort of got into perm, I would discover permaculture. Quite strange, really. I was I was at Ruskin College in in Oxford, incidentally, where I met Mike from Permanent Culture now, and. Um, Previous to that, I'd lived in a two-bedroom house in Salford, and I was really skint at the time. Are you still getting me there, Norris? Um, yeah, yes, we're... I think that, that was me. I, I should I didn't warn you that, Steve, previously, but for some reason, I have a tendency to jump in and out of uh, Skype. I think through my, my studies of the surrounding area, although Birmingham's on a plateau, I'm in a slight dip here. I think that's got something to do with it, but um, everyone else is there, so if I jump out, do I, I carry on talking then, or...? Yeah, you carry on talking, and then someone else will jump in with questions. Yeah, I, I heard the intriguing bit at the beginning, that it was quite strange. That was as far as I heard. Right, well, uh, how I discovered permaculture, I was living in a two-bedroom house on my own in 1992, and at that point in my life, I was really skimmed. There wasn't a great deal of work about. I was sat in the, uh, the backyard of this two-bedroom house one morning, and I noticed that it was getting a full effect of the, the, the south sun into basically a south facing backyard mm. and I thought right I, I can grow food here because the sun was there all day basically it was a full on sun trap but I had no money at the time but I had this idea of <laughs> making a garden from nothing so rather, rather painstaking efforts I, I found a skip full of, soil, full of topsoil about a quarter of a mile away and I virtually emptied the skip over two days into a rucksack and a mountain bike the soil to and fro from this site to to the backyard. And I found window frames, I found loads of bricks in the area that builders have left. I made raised beds. Um, I couldn't afford seats. Seats were really expensive back in the 90s, you know, sort of two, three pound a packet. So I went and pestered anybody who knew, you know, asked if anybody had any seeds. Went down to the allotment site, pestered some of the old guys down there. And I ended up that year where I was able to grow so much food that I could provide at least one large meal a day. This was from a little Coronation Street style house, like a a backyard basically. So fast forward a couple of years, I kept this garden going, you know, it fed me, it kept me sort of fairly healthy and I learned a bit about gardening. And I went to Ruskin College in 1996 and they were running this course called an Introduction to Permaculture course. I thought, looks interesting this, and there was some 
sort of vague blurb underneath about gardening. And the f- I attended the first session, sort of got chatting to the guy a little bit, and, and I found out it's basically what I've been doing at home, although in a very rudimentary way. And from that point on, you know, I'd sort of entered into the academic world, didn't didn't have a guard to speak of, was going to be moving about between different student, uh, student houses for the next three years. And I kind of put permaculture on hold. And um, after the death of my mother, when I graduated and moved back up north, got myself an allotment plot in 2000. And it's basically sort of my knowledge base has been developing from then onward. And you get to the point sometimes with permaculture books and every other book where you're reading, you're reading it sort of cover to cover, inside out. But you, but you really need to do a course to kind of pull everything into line. And from discovering permaculture in 1992 through my own practices to actually doing a PDC, uh, it's taken sort of well over a decade. But I eventually had some spare money in 2011 and um, we went and did our PDCs with Patrick Whitefield. And it was kind of Patrick's course was a way of pulling a large amount of knowledge that I'd gathered over the years, practical and theoretical, of pulling it together into the system of permaculture design. So it was quite... Um, it was quite an eye opener, really, sort of going on the path of reading and practicing and trying stuff, and then actually going and doing the full course with a guy who's just got this incredible knowledge of ecosystems and how ecosystems work. And that was really how how I got into permaculture. And like yourself, it's you know it's probably the of all, all the sort of philosophies and ideas and sort of practices that humanity has developed. You know, we really, really need to spread this one. Yeah, because yeah, oh. there, there is nothing else, literally. You know, organic agriculture on its own can't do it. Plus, it be, you know, the agriculture would be too scaled up. You'd end up with a similar scenario where you put massive inputs in and only getting tiny outputs. So it's permaculture all the way from meanery. Yeah, well, I definitely agree with that. I mean, it boils down to common sense for me. It's just common sense, isn't it? And like you say, I was really, that was really interesting story because it just started for you with observation really of yeah. where the light was and how it was falling and you know that that's where it all comes from but I, I'm a massive uh, I love Patrick <laughs> he's just amazing he has said that he'll come on the show but I'm a bit scared yeah. to have him on because I don't know what the, he knows too much almost <laughs> I don't uh, know where to start with what what to ask him <laughs> he's a bit like um he's like it's like a sort of British permaculture sage really Please. know where he has I mean a, a lot of practitioners have done lots and lots of courses but Patrick's actually lived out in the wild in a TP for a decade where he was able to do all these field studies and that's where he's, he's, he's developed his vast knowledge of ecosystems, guilds and plant relationships within nature mm-hmm. well, you know, he's, uh, he's got all the all the practical background stuff and the theory as well. So oh, he's quite a special dude, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's worth a mention, actually, that he um, works from Raglan's Lane Farm, which is, um, it's Gloucestershire, isn't it, Steve? That's right. Yeah, right. yeah. And right, this, yeah. Uh, great set on there. Yeah. And I'm actually, myself, doing, um, he started running these online courses, which um, I was saying to Steve earlier, a fantastic because obviously I've got the three kids here. I'm pretty tired here, short of cash, all that. So um, I'm doing this online. He's got this. Um, it's so there's kind of a resource base there, and then there's a forum, and we also have um, Skype. So yeah, it's it's an ideal. Uh, you know, it's a it's a very inclusive way of learning that aspect of permaculture that you need to learn, really. Isn't it? aspects that I'm trying to achieve here so I can apply what I'm learning um, online to what I'm yeah. doing around me so it, it's been really good for me, I mean to do courses and go away is fantastic but it's not a massive option for me at the minute so you know it, it, it's been fantastic um, so how, how did that lead you on to sort of um, the permanent culture now? Well uh, that's- it's quite strange, really. I mean, that's another intriguing story. Of, um, I sort of discovered permaculture as the word permaculture at Ruskin College, but I also met Mike there, Mike Thomas, who I do permaculture now with. And 
you know, there was there was a decade age difference between us, but we were both working class lads who, you know, we'd sort of done various aspects of community work for. And mm. the funny thing that that that, um, that me and Mike gelled with is two things really: a deep and profound hatred for the Tories, and uh, a love of dance music. <laughs> I'm, I'm a musician myself, and I write bits of drum and bass and dub reggae, and I've been in bands before. And Mike's sort of very much into, you know, very sort of modern electronic dance music. So mm-hmm. we had these two interests. And it was kind of, you know, after we did Ruskin, we, we both studied at University of Bristol together. And as you mm-hmm. probably know, Bristol's quite, in terms of alternative culture, you know, permaculture and all that all that sort of thing. It was a, it was a very strong yep. sort of grassroots thing there as well. So I kind of knew, you know, once I'd, I'd sort of lived with Mike for a couple of years and got to know him, you know, We'd argued a lot, you know, but good, good sort of solid arguments about politics and philosophy and stuff. But I mm-hmm. kind of knew that eventually, you know, you get these sort of thoughts every now and again. Thought we're going to do something together, a project type thing, you know. And it was, it was always on the cards, really. But it, I mean, yeah, I sort of throughout the two thousands, I didn't see a great deal, of Mike. And then when we did meet up, we'd sort of discuss what we were into, and you know, I was in firm culture. And I explained to Mike, Mike's a filmmaker as well, that's another one of his, uh, his really good skills. He's made um, an underground sort of classic film about dubstep. And I think he's also done some uh, social care stuff for his, uh, his master's degree. He's got a um, master's degree in filming. So mm-hmm. there, was, there was this connection of Mike as a filmmaker and, um, you know, a very, a very logical thinker and very organised um and, and from my side, I was sort of in permaculture gardening, little bits of political stuff, guerrilla gardening, but I was really veering towards the, um, away from politics and towards the solutions, really. You know, mm. of course, permaculture is riddled with solutions to, to, to most ills that, um, the political ideologies cause. You know, permaculture is there saying, well, actually, if you try this, you know, everybody gets fed, the local ecology in the area, is is uh, sort of enhanced and you know people learn all these new skills mm. and it was kind of um, you know I mean I'd sort of racked my brain for years thinking well what, you know what will we end up doing <laughs> one day I just got a call off Mike um, I've had this idea about us starting this um, this knowledge base sharing knowledge sharing skills of stuff that we actually do in our own lives but also a lot of stuff that we've learned over the years you know, academic stuff, non-academic stuff, activist stuff, history, um, you know, sort of going back to uh, the commons particularly, that's one of the big areas that, that, that we were into, the idea of common land, basically, and that, you know, you have a common wealth, and the common wealth is people on the common land sharing the skills. Mm. So we, we, we'd always have this thing, Mike rung me up this day, blah, blah, should we try to try on this project, and I nearly sort of jump down the phone to say yes to it and the great thing and I think why I mean we've done reasonably well for the short amount of time we've existed we're both incredibly committed to to social justice and ecology I mean you know with our qualifications and stuff from going to Red Brick Unis and Ruskin we could have easily you know and sold out and gone the career path and be earning 70 and 80 grand a year but you know that just doesn't put it for either of us really it's it's not about that, you know. So per- permanent culture now, you know, and we're both um, in the jobs that we're working. And I was working in, I mean, I'm a teacher by trade. I've worked in mental health, worked with refugees and asylum seekers, um, the sort of battered mums who, you know, victims of domestic violence. Mike had been running youth projects in Gloucester, and that sort of work for us. It came to the point where we were both unemployed, and you both sort of um, outlived previous work you, you know you've done as much as you could so in a way permanent culture now you know is even though we're not earning any money out of this so is you know possibly the step far next so if you want to call it evolution of work you know where you go if you're actually going into something that you're more comfortable doing where perhaps you can help more people really and it's you know it's been a learning curve for both of us really I mean it's um, virtually everything everything I'm doing now you know whether it's making rocket stoves doing cob 
you know, messing about, sort of tinkering and trying to invent stuff on me a lot. We sort of film everything now because we, there's, um, we, we believe that there's a thing called practice in, um, I think it comes from sort of social science a lot, and it also comes from general science. And practice is where you have sort of theoretical ideas generate that are then sort of put into the real world. And practice sort of happens at, at, at points in history and certain things. And we believe that, you know, permaculture now is in the practice stage where there's lots of people going out and doing it and applying it through design, through strategies, etc. But there's also an awful lot of people experimenting, tinkering and trying stuff out. So with all this tinkering and sort of experimentation, some of it will work, some of it won't, but the stuff that works, you know, we'll bang that up on, on our website or spread it all over social media, even if it's something dead small, like, if you, you know, creating a new plant guild, trying these plants together. It's all taking the theory, experimenting, trial and error, and then bringing it into the knowledge arena of um, by itself. So we, we think, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're into... Um, we're into permaculture, we're, in, we're into a lot of other stuff because the way we look at the future, I mean, I think permaculture will provide the food, the quality, um, the skills that we all have to learn. To a certain level, it can, it, you know, it's quite good community building profit if it's properly. We're, we're sort of, we're looking at a broader picture where basically you take the best, the best sort of stuff that's developed um, from humanity, you know, certain things that have happened in history, uh, the best educational models that suit everybody as opposed to a few. So permanent culture now is really um, it's a way of me and Mike sort of fusing 2,000 years of ideas um, to, to pick the best of what we've done in those last two or 3,000 years and but to have permaculture as the, um, the underpinning for all of it. And website and how we work and everything else is sort of underpinned by permaculture traffic. But, you know, and as I say, we haven't actually made any money out of it, but I'm sure, you know, if we were asked to do paid talk, we certainly would be charging, you know, some of the exorbitant fees that that are sort of expected in the world of seminars and, you know, sort of paid seminars and lectures and stuff. I mean, I've heard of people, you know, who haven't got a big name being paid thousand quid for an hour's talk that's outrageous you know if, if you if you paid a thousand pound per book you know you get me mike probably seven or eight other speakers you get loads of practical workshops and all the rest of it so i suppose what i'm saying really really isn't about money it's just about trying to get these ideas and certainly you know the, the fact that we are pulling all these ideas from history we see that as um, if you look at the permaculture mind, that's enacting the sort of holistic nature of permaculture by looking at all these ideas in history. So, you know, it's um, it's it's a very interesting sort of growth thing, you know, because you're learning all sorts of stuff all the time. Uh, you know, skill sharing, left, right, and swapping stuff with people. And it's all very natural. There's no, uh, uh, how you put it, it's not attached to difficult with like it's a very sort of natural and very down to earth thing I think when you sort of confirm your, your daily life if you want to look at it that way well I don't know do you do you see it like that Maurice oh most definitely I'm actually really on your wavelength and um I suppose that's why I'm so inspired by what you're doing because that's sort of what I'm trying to create here in Birmingham. I mean, there's there's a lot of little projects going on here and right. sort of when, when I started the uh, the permaculture group, it, it was kind of one of them that, you know, like you say, Bristol, there's so much going on in Bristol and, um, you know, the places up north and, you know, in London that, you know, Birmingham should really kind of stamp a foot on the map in permaculture terms. Um, so yeah um, we're kind of we are all sort of gradually linking up and in fact I found out today about a project that's up the road um, which is why I know people you know slag Facebook off and I understand why but 
it was through Facebook I found about the about these guys and they're only around the corner virtually so I'm going to go up and visit them and that's another community garden so um, yeah I really want to um, get into the you know the groups of well yeah well it, it's everyone really isn't it everyone yeah. you know I, I don't really want to describe it in terms of groups of people because it's just all inclusive you know, yeah. we want to reach everyone. <laughs> you go um, beyond, I mean, I'm not mentioning them as group once you go beyond that because having groups and distinctiveness sometimes it's a way of building tribalism, isn't it? Mm, and mm. you haven't got that if it's just stripped down to the fact that, hey, this is people. We're all doing, you know, we're all growing, we're all sort of trying to look out for the community, etc. And it becomes a completely new thing, doesn't it? Where, you know, this, it's the great permaculture is a great levelling agent in our time. Mm. No, because things are that incredibly bad in loads of areas it's almost like sort of going home you know after you've been travelling away for years it's like very human it's very workable and there's an awful lot we can do and you know and I say this without arrogance or, or ego but I think permaculture could, could, could definitely sort of restore the biosphere no that was that's totally been agree down. yeah totally agree with you yeah yeah I know it's funny I had another meeting with council people today <laughs> i do like to talk to them <laughs> find out what they're up to <laughs> what they're thinking um it's right. funny because around here i did say to him so we are we deprived that's what they <laughs> that's what they say we're deprived around here i'm not really quite sure what they mean by that really but that's that's yeah. what we classed as deprived so yeah. and that's we're that's just all them. yeah it's i mean that that's where the sort of the group things come in because they they just want to know if you want to work with alcoholics and people with mental health problems and yeah. like yeah we do but you've got, got to look at alternative means of 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 working and actually the people I met from the council today I mentioned resource based economies and skill sharing and stuff and they appeared to take it on board I mean it's difficult to tell you know. But yeah, um, I, we're quite fortunate because, in, do, do you know Sandwell? I don't, not everyone's heard of it. No, is it, is, is it outskirts of Birmingham, is it? Or? Yeah, it is. It's kind of um, a Bermuda Triangle between <laughs> Birmingham and Dudley. You're all right. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it grew up through industry. That's why people sort of settled here rather than going into the main industrial Birmingham area initially I suppose um, and yeah so we've got our own council but it's, so it's fairly small um, which is quite a help there's a lot of face to yeah. face that you can have going on whereas in Birmingham I think it's the second largest authority in the country you know there's yeah. no getting to see anyone face to face about anything you know so um, it's yeah but um, that's what I've been doing, really, very much, like you say, is just trying to link with people in the area, doing various things and um, get us all working together and supporting each other and making more of it. So I'm, I'm working with a local church at the minute and we're hopefully going to get a community garden on there. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, work, working. I just want to connect, connect with people and share share the knowledge really and get people in, independent in the proper sense of the word yeah well that's it I mean you know now I mean monetarism and neoliberalism capitalism really has died it's like it's like a court switching you know where people still think of life in it and there mm -hmm. is and, and all that's left really is lo local local resource bases that are generated from whatever grows best in certain areas you know it really is that's i believe you know that's a, that's the economy of the future really you know locally produced and locally used resources mm. because you know every area and every climate of the uk can produce a lot of it can produce the same stuff but there'll be some areas like the southwest you know where perhaps you'll be able to grow different varieties of fruit that we can't up north but, you know, there's no reason why we can't grow this, you know, massive, diverse resource base and share it amongst the UK. You know, it seems fairly straightforward to me, really, in a way. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it's it's true. I mean, you know, um, someone did ask me a while back about, you know, can you be sort of, you know, self-sufficient as an individual? And the answer is no, you probably can't. But once you create this kind of network, that that's how it all sort of begins to flow. And yeah. then, you know, it, 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 oh, I don't know. I hate saying these things now because they seem like such cliches, but it is all that being the change and you start from you and then that's how it fans out, you know. It, it's you, true. I mean, people could say what they like about it, but that's that's how, it, how it's developing, isn't it? And mm. I don't know how it really. Yeah. Well, of course, the seeds was the big thing. We were chatting about that earlier, weren't we? You know. Yeah, I mean, um, I've actually got some friends that are over in Bali. They're working with Humanitad, um, and they're working with farmers there now to um, start growing this red rice, which is the tr- traditional heritage variety, um, yeah. as opposed to the stuff that's forced upon them. Um, Hi, Steve. It's Bob here. You know, and, and, no, and Reese is back. Oh, did I go? I didn't even notice. You something. did. You went silent. Yeah, you did, oh. Nerese. Um, there is a caller on, Nerese, who's been waiting for a little while. I don't know whether you want to bring him in now. Yeah, yeah, why not? What's her name? Hello, caller. That fish isn't me, is it, by the way? Yes. Oh, I'm yes, just it using is. The... Oh, sorry. I'm just using this channel because I'm having difficulty listening to the show via the webpage, so don't, don't mind me. <laughs> oh, so you don't, you don't want to comment? Um, I'd rather listen, if that's okay. Yes, <laughs> no <problem>. that's fine. <laughs> We've got a lot of stuff to get through anyway, haven't we, Nerese? We have, we most certainly have. We most yeah. certainly have. And yeah. Like I say, say, Steve, this show is an open forum now, so anyone that wants to come on any week and chat about anything relevant to permaculture, they are more than welcome. Um I'd like some of the guys from America to come on and talk about... I've never heard of them, but um, they're talking about all these crosses between... I'm going to get this wrong now. Bob, did you hear Miles was talking about this? And another guy's been emailing me about is it, um, plums and nectarines. Apparently, it's quite common in America. Yeah, I, I have heard about it. I mean, not in very much detail. Um... I don't, plums and nectarines. Yeah, well, they're very similar things, aren't they? Mm, oh no, or maybe it was plums and peaches. I don't know. Would that make it a pleach? Yeah, they've got all these bizarre names <laughs> for them as well, yeah. <laughs> or a pun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, they have got all these crazy names for them. So, but no, I, I'd never heard of them before. Um, but yeah so anyway back to the seeds um we've created a group now for um the exchanging of seeds um so we've created it on facebook um and i've also linked it to our group website so that people who hate facebook can um go on there and exchange seeds and i'm hoping hoping that people will just literally contact each other and exchange them either locally or you know post them to each other so i've put a list of the seeds we're holding in our seed bank um and i'll happily if i can afford it post them to people um whoever wants to seeds and wants to grow um and you know it's important anyway but it's also in response to the latest legislation that i think it's is it the 6th of may now that's gonna be looked at and potentially passed well the truth behind it is um since 2008 unless a seed is registered you have not been allowed to sell it in the uk in the eu so um, that's already illegal, and on Monday they are going to be voting on um, seeds and propagation materials, and the vote is likely to go 
towards not even being able to give away seeds or propagated material. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Oni, I, I haven't. Um, I want to delve a bit more into that draft document because someone pointed out to me that there was something about. Um, there were exceptions on that. And one of them was passing seeds person to person, but it's all a bit confusing because you you know you can't can't actually sell heritage seeds now anyway. So I don't know. What's your feelings on this one, Steve? Um, well, there was all there was all the codex elementary stuff that I mentioned earlier in mm. seed bands in the US and. It was also a bill put before the uh, Parliament in New Zealand about the, the banning of sort of cultivating your own seeds and sharing them. But I followed it for a little while and there didn't actually seem to be any of these sort of laws put in place. Mm. Now, I think this, this is an entirely different thing, the European thing, of course, because the Codex Alimentarius thing's probably been going on about four, four or five years now. Mm. And... Um, you know, if they are if, if they are looking at this sort of legislation, and you know, we need seed swaps all the time, uh, seed sharing groups like your own, and we need to just basically just ignore it and t- to even sort of cultivate even more different varieties of hail and, and keep the diversity going, carry on crossing, and carry on, you know, creating new varieties of tomatoes or pea, whatever. Um, I, I just think basically. Ignore the legislation and get on with it, but, ha- but perhaps accelerate and grow and share even more than what we're doing now. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, there's, stu- there's stuff going on in America with, you know, that, that, that is completely true. I mean, you've only got to follow a little bit of what Ma- Monsanto are up to with the marketing and stuff, and they own a massive share of the US seed market. Mm. You know, and there was the, was it 50,000? Organic farmers in the U.S. filed lawsuits against Monsanto, mm. uh, basically for a share of the seed market because they're, they're, they're sort of dominating and pushing further and further into the seed market. Where obviously their their end goal is to have us all hooked on their seed, as as was the tragic case with Indian farmers who were sold seeds that would that were promised to produce this huge yield. They didn't, and a lot of farmers really tragically ended up committing suicide. Thousands did, you know, over the last decade. All all because of Monsanto. So yeah, it's um, it's quite, it's quite, well, it's a very, very important issue really. I mean, if you have a government or an ideology that's able to control your your seed stock, they've absolutely got you. Well, I don't know about you guys on this one, but I will not comply with it. No, same way. Absolutely either. not. It's a fundamental right that everyone should be able to save, save and swap seeds. Of course. Um, it's as fundamental as water, in my opinion. Yep, I agree. And, absolutely. and at the risk of um, plugging my own show, the lead feature tomorrow is all about this EU... Um, seed legislation. All right. So if anyone wants to jump in on my show tomorrow, um, you're more than welcome to comment. In fact, Steve, if you want to come on, Nyrees is coming on. If you want to come on and chat about it from your point of view as well, I'll be more than happy for you to do so. When's that, tomorrow night? Yeah, 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Not sure I can, but I'd certainly like to... I'd, you know, I'd certainly like to come on in the future if, if there was a, a chance of it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I mean, well, what you do, Bob, if you, if you send me a message with some sort of link in it to, to what you're doing, I can promote that on all of our social networks and our website, if you like. Well, what I can do, Steve, is, is um, give you a link to the podcast once we've published it. Great. Brilliant. All right, um, I'll, I'll do it through Nyrese in the first instance because I haven't got you in my phone book, have I? No. Okay, mate, that sounds good. Yep. Unless I can work out how to. I'm, I'm on a Windows machine at the moment and it's very different to my Linux machine at home. Ah, uh, yeah, I bet. Anyway, sorry to 
push my own interests, Nairis. Mm, please do, please do. I've told you before, Bob, these are the edges. <laughs> yep. The permaculture edges, that's where the magic happens. <laughs> yeah. Quality is here. Diversity. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, so, um, Steve, have you got an actual sort of set site that you work from now then or do you just yeah. sort of go yeah, to, to other people's sites or how, how does it work for you guys are you talking permaculture in Bolton sort of the place? yeah yeah you know do you just go yeah. to to community gardens or have you got an actual site yourselves that we've got you... quite a few sites i mean we've got um we've got a north facing front garden that's uh, perennial flowers got quite a large back garden where I grow hops to make my own beer with. I've got perennial herb section there. Um, salad, what I call the salad bar, which is a huge upright shelf against the wall with massive containers on with salad. So this is kind of, you know, zone zero. Then I've got two lot of plots that are about five minute walk away. Now those two plots, I've got one plot that's completely and utterly perennial, everything on it. Uh, that's it's based on a sort of micro design of a food forest with my own variation. I've got some got ponds dotted about here and there. And then the other plot that I've got on the same site, I grow sort of traditional um, sort of seasonal vegetables that all you know all the old boys on the plot grow. But the the most strangest thing that I've got, and there's there's a bit of a mad story here. If there's time, it'll probably take about five minutes to tell you. <clears throat> I met this guy about six months ago, and he was called. Um, he was our local community builder, that was his job title. And he, he drew me to this pub one night. And I was thinking, you know, God, I've never been in here. It's quite a dull-looking pub. Big old Victorian building. And um, the landlord of the pub came over and he went, you, Steve? And I went, yeah. And he said, I want to have something to show you. And he virtually dragged me out of this door at the side of the pub, at which point you're thinking, what the bloody hell is this? What's going on? And he took me down to these, these um, two sort of clay clay covered tennis courts with the clay gravelly sort of finishing on the top and they're basically two large tennis courts with the fence round and he pointed at them and he said they're yours rent free forever I said oh. and he said he said oh Gary's told me that um, you're into this organic gardening thing and that you want to try and grow, grow vegetables in the community for community members and I said yeah that's right and he said well what are you waiting for that's your, it's yours now so, I mean, we acquired that site fairly recently. We've got some, we've got some funding coming. Hopefully, we'll be able to get our hands on it next Friday when it's cleared, and that's that's going to be enough to do some infrastructure stuff to put upon there. Um, we're going to try and avoid raise avoid raised beds a little bit and try and keep it sort of ground level as we can. But we're probably going to have to put a few raised beds in there to start off with, and then we're going to make um, a structure from cob some locally sourced timber that's lying all over the show um, we've got some funding for solar panels for the roof and the maddest thing is this: when this little hut's built I'm going to have the hut um, officially accredited by Open College Network as a place that can deliver and design accredited qualifications for people so what we're planning to do on that site we're going to work with unemployed people and you know people sort of recovering from drug problems and people on the upside of, of mental health and we're going to while they're sort of helping us to grow we're going to be sort of helping them to grow in the way that we're going to put them through accredited qualifications free of charge and, and for us it's all about it's about like lasting relationships with the community mm. you know apart from sort of doing the courses and growing food and stuff so on this particular site our outreach work is going to be sort of visiting houses on the council estate where people get a kit of a small plastic greenhouse of the type that you see for about £10. A couple of bags of compost, a wooden raised bed and some seeds and a few plants to start them off. And that's, that's our outreach that we'll be taking from the tennis court site, if you like. We're sort of arming people with kit and things that we've grown on the site. So, quite excited about that, really. So that's, the, uh, that's the latest thing. But then the other land and it's quite funny when you think about permaculture zones because we've got a woodland that's about probably almost half a mile walk from here and it's, it's owned by the council and it's it's just not been managed in the slightest to the point where 
the woodlands degenerating. Um, and me and my partner go down there every winter and we, we coppice the woodland and we use the wood for firewood. We've got a wood burning stove in our council house here and we've built these sort of beautiful wooden arches in the garden that I've got my hot vine and my grapevine growing up. So this this resource, you know, it's a, it's a council on woodland. We can't afford to manage it. And, it's, and it provides us with firewood every year. And we're actually doing the woodland a favour by selectively taking certain trees out so other sort of younger up-and-coming up trees can come through. And nature's doing us a favour there. And we're, we're sort of helping nature a little bit. We're doing the coppicing and we're kept warm all through the winter. And we've got wood for, you know, for, if we're making, making things, craft-type things or... It's just good to have timber around for, you know, a resource that you can apply to a lot of different situations. So that's, you know, playfully, my zone five is council owned woodland. Oh, that's fantastic. It's amazing. You know, it, it is quite interesting. We've got a few sort of ancient woods and stuff left around here in Birmingham. I've got one up the road from me, but, you know, I find... Um, <clears throat> the relationship between man and trees really interesting because yeah. woods wouldn't really develop a, a, as we know them without the intervention of man, would they? You know, it's um, it's a massively symbiotic relationship there between yeah. trees. It's very, it's very um, quite the unlikely synergy, isn't it? Where you know the modern rational mind wouldn't entertain the idea of that, but. The modern rational mind is created, it's created in, an, in abstract. We don't live in abstract. You know, we live, live within a living ecosystem that feeds us. Where and we, if we act right, we put our we, we feed our ecosystem as it feeds us. If we if we do things the right way, so you know, I completely agree with you. And you, you know, the, the the profound effect that trees have had on human beings generally. If you look at a lot of these sort of pre pre-Christian and pre-Islamic religions and cultures. I mean, certainly throughout Hinduism, Buddhism, paganism and some of the older um, polytheist cultures, if you want to call them that. Mm -hmm. You know, trees are revered in every culture. Yeah, yeah. The, the well, they're there, that's, aren't they? <clears throat> that's how I actually got into uh, permaculture because I was a member of the Druid Order um, and I was stood in the body grade at that time and it was just a leaflet that came through with um, the Guersu that um, they sent me and that, that yeah that's how I found out about it and that's how I went on that first introductory course um, so yeah interesting isn't it because we, we were talking in Bristol last week we did some talks at the Anarchist Book Fair and we were saying about how what backgrounds people come from who discover permaculture and you seem to have you've got a range of You've got sort of political, you've got eco-political activity. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps they've been very active for years and then they've discovered permaculture, found out about the solutions that it offers and they've sort of gotten into that way. And then you've got people who've gotten, gotten into it through politics, people through horticulture, and, and certainly through paganism and, you know, sort of, I don't know what you call them, earth beliefs, I think I call them, where... You know, people have a reverence for nature as a baseline. I'm not calling it religion, but as a, as a belief system. Well, you know, yeah. so that's there in us underneath all everything that's been sort of fed into us through psychology, religion, and education. I think that is right inside of us that, you know, it is us. Our gift is what we do within nature. And, you know, acknowledge mm. all these, the interlinked bits and pieces if you like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no I think it does transcend religion I mean I'm not a member of the uh, Druid Order anymore because I don't think I want to link to anything that has any kind of connotations yeah yeah that's understandable I, th I think the key for all of us is to do whatever we're comfortable with, isn't it? Of course, yeah. Yeah. And wh whatever, yeah. We, you know. Yeah, and, and don't be led 
don't exactly. try and be a leader, but don't be led either. You know, just carve your own way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I must admit that I think that's why Druid Re jumped out at me initially because it does teach that. You know, it draws on sort of philosophies from around the world and teaches you not to sit at the foot of gurus. Um, you know, and that that is what. Well, it, yeah. It, like you say, someone else was saying this to me the other day actually it's experimentation isn't it you know that, mm. that's what it's all about it's about creating stuff I'm kind of at this sort of crossroads now at the minute in my life of you know basically all I want to do is create stuff every day not necessarily just you know in terms of growing stuff but just in terms of I just want to make stuff all the time well, ultimately, that's what we're here to do, isn't it? We are a creative species. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, for a, the greater part, that's what's educated out. And, you know, we're kind of brought up not to be creative, but to be consumers. Yeah. Consumers and workers. Yeah. Well, slaves, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Course, yeah. yeah, it is. It is good citizens. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've started to. That's why it's the small steps, isn't it? Because what I've decided now is right. Everything I need. So the next time I run out of washing up liquid, well, no, that happened today actually. I ran out of washing up liquid, so I thought, right, I'm making some. So everything I run out of now, I'm just going to make. <laughs> that's that's my current plan. So, you know, take it from there. It's all doable as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I kind of, we touched on this, uh, I can't remember if we were on or off then when we were talking about this, Steve, but, um, you know, there's this um, thing about, um, obviously, going back to the synergy, but if you, you know, there's that with honey, when you, um, it's good for allergies and, you know, if you buy honey from your locality, it combats that kind of stuff. And yeah. I'm thinking, you know, it does go further than that, I think. This is only theory, obviously. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> um, but actually, interestingly, that's the point oh, I was going to make earlier, that that's another group of people that are quite prevalent in the permaculture world, is people who have trained as scientists or worked as scientists scientists and have this kind of understanding of bacteria and kind of things that might be happening underground and microbes and you know there's that whole sort of science thing there which is really important you know because yeah, definitely. Um, it gives more validity to permaculture doesn't it if, well, if, um, if a lot of it can be scientifically proven in terms does. of objective knowledge people will go all oh, right well it works because science says it does yeah it, well, it, that, that's the thing, you know, that I kind of think is the important to get across about permaculture, that, you know, there the is still a big element that when you kind of sort of initially express the, the ideas of it, that people, it's the whole, it's a bunch of hippies in a field. And, you know, I am actually a bit of a hippie, so I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the re, it's, there is... Uh, uh, well, wow. between the common sense and the observation and the actual knowledge we have of science, you know, it's not about going back and all having a horse and cart and like throwing your piss out in the street and the, you know, the, it's it, it's evolution, you know, it, it's exactly. taking from the past, embracing the good from the future and then combining them and moving on, you know. That's it. Well, that's the problem with mainstream media, isn't it? They think that anyone who's got any regard for the environment wants to go back to the Stone Age, and that's absolutely so far from the truth. Mm. I mean, we're using modern thinking, modern technologies, but adapting them to a much more sustainable... Sorry about the use of the Agenda 21 word but a no, much more no, sustainable well, future. Can I just say, that's our word, sustainable, that's our word. I won't let them take that word. I yeah, refuse, I won't 
sustainable. That's our word. That is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I've been, I've been meaning right. to get that off my chest for a while. I haven't actually said it out loud to any. Well, I'm glad you have now. Um, I won't worry about using that word quite so much anymore. <laughs> I shan't take that one. I refuse. <laughs> uh, sorry, I've, I've cut you off in your time. Right, you're right, because there's, um, there, is, there is two versions of sustainable, isn't there? Mm. You know, and the sustainable that we mean, you know, David Holmgren's, you know, version of sustainable of... Um, you know, through resi- perennial resilient ecosystems, mm. and that is that's true sustainability as opposed to well, we have to sustain this so that capitalism can carry on raping the earth, and we have to just oh, we'll stop that, so we'll just turn that into a conservation area for a bit. It, you know, it's a whole it's a whole new thing our, our sustainability, but I think people will understand it. And I think, did you have, um, I don't know, I saw a couple of things on Facebook, Steve, about, it was people giving you stick about the kind of political comments you yeah, had to say yeah. about the yeah. community and stuff. Yeah, it's quite got... interesting, actually. Um, we, we, got, we, had, we put a couple of posts up, Mike put one up about um, uh, celebrating the passing of uh, Margaret Thatcher. Mm. And there was another one that was quite sort of hard, hard hitting political that we put up. And, but we, we actually got, I got complaints through with my personal email address. I got this guy saying, um, I don't think that you are reflecting permaculture ethic in your thing of Margaret Thatcher. And I just explained that it's okay for other countries to mourn the passing of a tyrant by celebrating. Lots of countries do it and have it as part of the history. And this guy kind of, well, you know, we can't do that because we're English. And I just completely couldn't accept that sort of attitude, really. It was, it was, you know, like that woman killed people because of her policies. You know, she put whole communities on the dole for decades, etc. But, yeah, it's, I don't think people expect, when, when they see the word permaculture, I think they expect a, a very sort of soft, benign liberalism. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, permaculture is very, very radical, very incredibly radical. I mean, Bill Mollison said it, didn't he, about gardening being, you know, one of the most subversive activities you could do. Then mm. you had um, Mike Feingold, Bristol permaculture tutor. Was it uh, Dick Gardening is revolution in disguise, etc. And that's what all these people are kind of getting at, is. Yeah, oh, he's, he's amazing, Mike, yeah. People should look him up on YouTube. He's uh, so inspirational. I love watching him. He really makes me itchy to get out in the garden and start doing stuff. Great. <laughs> quite live. He, Mike, Mike sat on our panel, actually, um, at one of the talks we did at Bristol Anarchy Book Fair. And it was quite... It was a talk about, about what we've been talking about. We did this talk called Is Permaculture Political? Mm. And I, you know, I was meeting Mike for the first time. And he just looked at me and he said, is there really any need for this talk, Steve? But with this big sort of grin on his face. And he was quite, you know, he was quite right because, you know, it is obviously, you know, it's not poli- it's not a political idea or a political party, but because it p- provides solutions mm. that, that politics has tried to give people for years, it, you know, under the pretense of, mm. you know, we'll ensure <laughs> that you live in a just society. We're actually there saying, well, actually, you know, we can give you the just society without leaders, without hierarchies, without the exploitation of nature, etc. Yeah. So, you know, it is highly political in some way. Oh. Yeah, we've had all sorts of people moaning and whinging and hardly any of the arguments were rational in it. was all, you know, because we're into permaculture, you're expected to have this highbrow moral outlook. You know, but our thing was, look, I'm sorry, you know, catch your upset, kill people, you know, did this, that and the other, and no, we won't show any respect. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think we're... Are we, have we gone off now? Or are we still on? Um, no, he's still on. Oh, he's still on? OK, I think we need to wrap it up now, um, Steve. But okay. thank you so much for coming on. And please, please come on again. We're on every Friday, 9 till 10. Brilliant. So, I you know... I just, I'll just log in on Friday and sort of join in. 
Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And, you know, thanks, Bob. Yeah, no another worries. Good one. Another good one, spreading the word. <laughs>